So thanks to everyone for taking the time to come together today uh, in community. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to make some remarks about Naropa today and to share some thoughts about the future. Uh, I understand that the State of the Union address last night was the third longest in history, so I am not one to be outdone. Um, so tea is at four and dinner is at seven, uh, just so that you know. Um, so while everyone here is a member of the Naropa community in some form, uh, and the questions and the views and the thoughts of students, faculty, and staff overlap in many ways, uh, we also naturally have some different concerns and aspirations as well, and that's what makes uh, remarks like this a little bit challenging for me to figure out what most people want to hear about, um, but we'll see where that goes. Uh, my hope is to frame a conversation uh, that can take place over the rest of the semester, actually not one that just ends today, by touching on some of the highlights, sharing some of the successes, and naming some of the challenges that we face. There'll be some time today for questions and more time over the next few months as we do what we did last year, which was hold meetings at each campus in a less formal way for people to go a little bit deeper in some of the questions and, and uh, comments that you might have. Weird topic, state of the university. Um, clearly, there is no way to freeze time into something called a solid state. Uh, and anyone who tries to do that should be looked at suspiciously. Um, Naropa, the reality is, is a living organism uh, in many ways, uh, evolving and also decaying. Uh, and although we might, it's the reality, huh? <laughs> you should have seen me when I was 19. I mean, it's just, it's just different. <laughs> It's just different. Uh, we might want to break from the constant movement, but the reality is that it just can't happen. I cannot see anything here. This is great. This is going to be fun, because I can't read anything I've written. Uh, I guess there's nothing we can do, huh? Well, all right. We're, we're going to try. Ah, thank you. That, no, this is good. That, you got it. Yeah, they did it. No, that's very... That, <laughs> Yeah. Might have been more interesting. Well, anyway. Uh, but the fact that movement is constant alone is not something which should be the cause of either too much optimism or too much pessimism, for that matter. Uh, in addition to Naropa being a living organism, we live inside of a relative framework so that our state is completely linked to the ways in which we sit in the also ever-changing social and economic and spiritual universes. That said, there are many ways for us all to, uh, all of us acting alone or in community to influence the nature of our cosmic relationships. We've all experienced the results of our actions when we act from a place of compassion and wisdom and skillful action. And I believe it's probably fair to say that for most of us in this room, we've also experienced the outcomes when our way of being in any moment is grounded in ignorance and aggression and greed. Um, we have some choices to make all the time, and I think that's true for us as individuals, and it's true for us as an institution. What I might be able to do today is offer some information for us all to consider, to interpret, and to use as the basis for our work together. Uh, our friend and early board member, Roshi Bernie Glassman, uh, the Zen Buddhist teacher, drawing from the Zen master Dogen, considered information and life experience as a collection of ingredients that could be creatively combined by the cook and could make a feast that could feed a hungry world. Our founder, Trungpa Rinpoche, used a metaphor that was a bit lower down in the digestive tract, looking at the same information and experiences as the manure of past experience that, if used well, would support the emergence of healthy new forms. Both seem relevant uh, at this point in, in Naropa's existence. I've chosen to make note of what I think is worth looking at as we support and nurture Naropa, but my list, I acknowledge, may differ from yours, so please consider this to be an open source presentation. You can edit it, amend it as you find useful. One area I think worth looking at is the nature of the body that is Naropa, how we're organized and how we're integrated. And it's worth making a note and acknowledging some of the changes that we've made to our administrative structure, which in a sense is the sort of connective tissue of that body. 
Uh, as many of you know, we made a choice last year to combine our marketing and enrollment management work and to locate those activities in the Academic Affairs Division along with the responsibility for faculty and curriculum and student services. Uh, that decision was made for a number of reasons, but I think most importantly was to support the critically important need to stabilize and increase both graduate and undergraduate enrollment. And in November, Kelly Watt, our graduate dean of admissions, agreed to lead the marketing and enrollment departments and has worked effectively to improve systems, reallocate resources, and to support the staff. Uh, we're all grateful to Kelly in particular. Yes. <laughs> Yay but also to the entire admissions and marketing team who have, I think it's safe to say, have weathered some chaos. And in doing so, <laughs> hysterically so, they've done. Um, but have also retained their commitment, their good humor, and their creativity. And so gratitude extends to all of them. Sure, this is great. Who, which one is, who are the Republicans and who are the Democrats? I want to figure out, this, this is, Good. Um, one notable area of improvement which is worth mentioning is that Kelly and Jessica Breck, who's our Director of Student Financial Services and supported by, <laughs> this is great, by many, other, um, <laughs> many others, have simplified and accelerated the staff's ability to offer financial aid packages to accepted students. Now that seems like a, it may seem like a very, you know, kind of level of detail, but the reality is that in the current climate, students enroll in colleges frequently that reply the soonest with offers of financial aid, even if it's not the first choice because they're concerned about securing uh, a knowledge for the coming fall of what their financial uh, needs are going to be. We've now improved our timing by some months, which is proving beneficial and it's continuing to improve over time. And that's taken a lot of work by a number of people to allow uh, us to move forward in this way. Um, with respect to enrollment, I can say that spring enrollment met our budget expectations, which is great. Meeting expectations always better than the worse. Um, spring numbers are always smaller than the fall in any case, just because of the rhythm of our university. But it's good to note that we welcomed 63 incoming undergraduate students this January, which is the largest number of spring incoming students over the past six years, which is even better. So and a product of considerable work by a lot of people here. Fall 2018 numbers are, are trending in a good direction as well. And I could tell us why the numbers today look great, but that's going to be one of those you can't freeze things stories. It's probably not a good idea. There is a long way to go between now and registration in the fall. And while today's news is positive, we have a lot of work to do to make sure that what we end up with in the fall is equally so. We've also seen an increase in applications from students with significant financial need. As a university committed to improving diversity, we welcome those applications. And I want to be clear, low and modest income is just one indicator uh, that an applicant may come from a traditionally underserved community. And we need to do a lot more than find money in order to support diversity at Naropa. But providing financial aid, uh, and sorry, and providing financial aid doesn't substitute for the need to be a truly supportive and welcoming environment. However, meeting economic need is one way of addressing our goal to increase diversity. Last year I noted in my talk that we had moved our so-called discount rate, the amount of money that we, uh, uh, from tuition that we return to students in the form of financial aid from 32%, which is where it had sat for quite some time, to 36%. This last year, this current year, 2017, 2018, our discount rate has actually moved to 44%. That, good, it, yes, it is good. Um, and it, it puts us more in line with uh, other schools with, that our students are looking at when they consider uh, where to go to the university. That was accomplished uh, without the use of the traditional tools, which is raising tuition. Uh, that seemed very important to us. The holding tuition where it was was something that was a, a critical importance to the board and to, and to the staff here. It did take considerable hard work to add what amounts to a million dollars in additional financial assistance this year from what we had to available last year. And so in addition to supporting diversity, the additional financial aid is also needed to uh, meet the increased competition that we have from traditional and non-traditional alternatives which are now available to our students. 
Now, it has to be said that our entire staff and faculty body have been impacted by this need to increase financial aid. Most broadly felt was the need last spring to suspend Naropa's contribution to faculty and staff retirement plans. That retirement match costs us about $40,000 a month, and in the spring, we balance the need uh, for overall fiscal health, the absolute goal to not pass through what was a very significant increase in our health insurance premium, something that's faced across the country by institutions like ours, with the need for saving uh, some money and being able to offer additional aid. Um, this is an unacceptable long-term solution. I said it uh, when I sent my note out in the spring, and my commitment to restore the match remains very much in front of my mind. Uh, it's something that we are continuing to look at on a regular basis, and as I said before, uh, we will restore it in whatever pieces we can as we can do it, and not wait um, to get moving. My appreciation to all the faculty and staff who are definitely um, uh, struggling with this uh, uh, suspension of the retirement match. We're also looking hard at graduate school tuition. Historically, we've more or less charged the same amount per credit hour across all of our graduate programs. But the reality is there are some programs with ample demand and some that are in need of additional enrollment. One way to address that reality is not to be tied to a single rate of tuition and to look at our degree programs across the broader competitive landscape. This kind of work is possible now because of the efforts of Mara Dark, our institutional research director, and my colleague Cheryl Barber, along with many other people, because now we have the ability to look at making changes that are actually data-driven and reliable data is available to us, which is something that's incredibly important for our future planning. To continue to thrive, it's clear that the largest counseling psychology graduate programs need investment in facilities and faculty and support staff. And I can say that under the leadership of Dean Kathleen Gregory, the provost, senior leadership, and the faculty at GSCP, we're undertaking a comprehensive review of GSCP with a view that we need a broader set of strategic objectives, not a series of incremental changes. We'll make changes as they become obvious to us, but we need to have the bigger picture uh, refreshed at this point, we believe. The GSCP faculty and staff have worked tirelessly for decades to deliver quality programming, and they're deserving of that broad support. The faculty under the leadership of the provost has also worked over the summer to create an academic plan which establishes a framework by which programs, um, existing and proposed degree programs can be assessed. The hard reality is that some programs are not finding a market. There's always a need to look at ways in which better advertising and marketing and outreach of all kinds can positively impact enrollment. But we also have to take a hard look at the more painful reality that some programs may not be successful as they're currently structured. We're walking a fine line between the need to control costs and to find the means to gain enough time for program faculty to consider ways to revise curriculum and delivery methods. Um, we do, of course, need to look at creative new programs as well and new ways of delivering the content that is at Naropa's heart. So that's the kind of balance that we're working on constantly, is kind of acknowledging that we may be making, uh, to have some programmatic offerings that are in need of change and we have others that are gaps in the market that Naropa is uniquely suitable to fill. So, for example, I'm very supportive of the fresh thinking that's going on around the interdisciplinary uh, BA, enthusiastic about the success so far of the BA in art therapy. And we're especially excited, as I mentioned a little bit last year, about the new BA in elementary education and teacher licensure. I described that degree last year. I thank the faculty specifically that were involved in, in creating that program. But what I said last year was only an aspiration. It was what we hoped would happen. What I can say this year, which is the most important, is that over the past few months, we received both State of Colorado and Higher Learning Commission accreditation approval for this unique Naropa degree. And so the fruition of all the work um, that was done by faculty and staff over years uh, is now something that we will realize in the fall when we launch this program. Uh, As I mentioned last year when we celebrated, we received an $800,000 three-year lead gift to launch this program this coming fall, um, which uh, has allowed it really to take off. 
Uh, from my view, as mindfulness and contemplative practices are offered in public schools, and those schools have limited ability to actually ensure quality, uh, and as new teachers themselves are in great need of tools to support their personal health and their personal resilience, our new Naropa BA is a tremendous opportunity for us and I think a real offering to uh, elementary and soon to be higher uh, um, 7 through 12 education in the United States. So it's something that we should be very excited about. We need more students, so those of you that have friends that are interested in teaching, uh, we're open for business and we would love to talk to, talk to people about that. And as a result of the gift that we got last year, we have some targeted scholarship money that will enable, we hope, uh, a variety of students that might not otherwise think uh, this education is affordable to uh, come to Naropa. So it's something that we'd love to look at. Uh, the faculty is now reviewing a proposal to add a massage therapy component to the undergraduate curriculum. You might recall we talked a little bit last year that Naropa owns the curriculum of the former uh, Boulder School of Massage Therapy. Cheryl Barber's done a lot of work to coordinate um, a massage therapy track. She met this morning with the faculty curriculum committee, which, which was good, uh, as a way of reinforcing a health and healing uh, offering within our undergraduate college and also to add uh, career and livelihood opportunities to the undergraduate curriculum. Um, we're also going to bring a proposal forward to next week's Board of Trustees meeting. Some of my colleagues are here, so I'm not going to presume what you're going to do, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Uh, <laughs> Um, that Naropa acquired the Leap Now program. We have a formal relationship with Leap Now, which for those of you that don't know, offers a four credit alternative first year or freshman year experience to uh, undergraduates. We're currently the school of record for Leap Now, so that students who attend that program actually apply to and are accepted by Naropa. Um, and so they are Naropa students. Uh, and we, are, we receive revenue, a fee, for providing that service. Um, the founders of the program, both of whom have had long connection to Naropa in, in the past, are looking to retire and came to us first to see whether or not we'd be interested in talking to them about acquiring the business. In part, uh, I'm interested in doing it because we can increase the revenue uh, that we earn simply by moving the U.S. portion, it's in a study abroad program, but it has a domestic component, moving the U.S. portion from California to Colorado where we have uh, less expensive ways of delivering the uh, in-country program. But more than that efficiency, we see it as a strong opportunity to successfully retain more of the 40 students that right now attend the Leap Now program each year uh, as Naropa students in years two and beyond. We always keep some, but we're distant from those students uh, since they don't really come to Boulder. And our view is that if we have them here, if they're actually working in Boulder, if they're on campus and they're meeting students, um, the motivation to want to stay on uh, after the Leap Now experience would be greater. So it's something that we're looking at. We're still negotiating the financial component, but I can say that the plan is that the purchase price will be tied to the revenue generated by the program. We're not looking to fund the program uh, from other Naropa resources. And I'm sure there'll be questions at the board meeting. I should have more to talk about after the meeting and we have uh, a deeper discussion about this. Um, some other things that are happening which I think are important to note is that under the direction of the Director of Library Services and Archives, Amanda ribbon uh, and the generosity of uh, one particular donor, Jane Dalrymple Hollow, uh, we've taken some significant steps to improve archive access, both physically and digitally. Uh, we're moving the archives from a now off-site location to new space, which is adjoining our offices at 63rd Street. So we're kind of trading space, but moving it next to the offices that now house human resources development uh, and business and finance. That's going to allow, it's a bigger space, it'll allow more access and it'll allow a lot more security. So exciting to be moving uh, the archives closer. Amanda's done a ton of work with a consultant that we were able to hire because of Jane's generosity. Uh, and there's more to say about that uh, over uh, the next couple of months. It has to be noted that Naropa's biggest financial challenge, and saying this is a challenge for any other small school, is the considerable reliance that we have on traditional tuition to fund our operations. Uh, as I've discussed already, we've been focused on increasing other sources of revenue, such as the potential of the Leap Now program, but there's more that we have to do. Philanthropy clearly needs to increase. 
Now, last year, the Office of Development raised a record number of gifts. Fantastic, it was extremely helpful, and it was due to the hard work of the development staff under uh, Angela's leadership. The even more, the even better news is that this year we're on track to exceed what happened last year, which, which is even better. We're in the fourth year of our $10 million fundraising campaign, and last year I noted that we were about 40% of the way toward meeting that goal, uh, and I can say that uh, this year we're at 60%, so great progress in the last 12 months. Now, much of that money, this is not a traditional capital campaign. We're not squirreling away or prairie dogging away the money for, <laughs> always have to have a prairie dog reference in these talks, um, uh, for uh, new buildings, but we are using the money to support students uh, through scholarships, housing, and other uh, means of support. Uh, the campaign is clearly, message of the campaign is clearly resonating with an increasing number of donors. One of the ways for us to continue having success in the fundraising area is for me to be able to serve in the same way that most college presidents do, by having the flexibility to travel and to cultivate donors. Uh, I've been involved in raising funds for nonprofits for mm, 30 years or more, and what I can say is that the donors today do want a deeper relationship and deeper engagement than anything I've experienced previously. They're also looking for creative ways to be supportive, so not just with money, but with also with ideas and energy and effort. Um, we need to be creative and we need to be able to work with donors and meet them where they are. So for example, we recently received the gift of a house in the Northwest United States by a donor. Um, took a lot of work, the door was opened by, uh, by Angela and by our recently retired Major Gifts Officer, Aaron Farrell. Um, the result of which was the donor ended up with a significant tax uh, write-off and at some point in the future, Naropa will receive uh, a house that's worth about a million dollars that we'll be able to sell and, and bring funds back to Boulder. Now, in this particular case, we have to wait for the donor to pass on, so we, we hope it will be a while before we get the house, but, but there it is. But pass on, we will, so it, that's what's going to happen. Um, closer to home, a local real estate developer who's doing a significant um, affordable housing development in North Boulder had a small parcel of land as part of a bigger project that he had to have a nonprofit own for a period of time, and it's complex, but that was the requirement by the, by the uh, uh, city. Uh, he approached us and we worked out a situation where Naropa now owns this parcel of land. It will ultimately become 20 units of low-income housing. Uh, and later this summer, we'll receive $350,000 in proceeds for serving as the nonprofit um, uh, home for a while for this land. And, and I have no idea where it will go, but the same guy just sent me a note and asked me if I would have coffee with him tomorrow because he has another idea. So we'll see. <laughs> I don't know what will happen, but think good thoughts about that, so we'll see. But these are the kinds of complex and time-consuming conversations uh, that are essential for our long-term health. Um, and as I noted, you know, the doors are open by the development office. Um, I then am able to come and step in and hopefully carry uh, these ideas to a successful outcome. Naropa has a great story to tell. I think that's obvious for anybody in this room. But what I need most is the time and opportunity to tell it. Certainly not alone. All of you have that same opportunity, and I hope feeling passion about telling the story. But for me, it is my day job, and it's something that I need the time to be able to do. That can only happen because my colleagues are ready and able to take on some of the administrative leadership tasks that traditionally the Naropa presidents have handled as well as the fundraising. And I can say that people have done so willingly. Um, taking on the leadership is not limited, however, to just the members of the cabinet. Uh, and the cabinet, for those of you that don't know, are Janet Kramer, our provost and vice president for academic affairs, Tyler Kelsch, our VP for operations, Cheryl Barber, who's the special advisor in the president's office, Regina Smith, the director of the Office for Inclusive Community, and Angela Madura, the development director. Some months ago, I talked with Janet and Tyler and asked them to consider ways that a greater number of administrative leaders at Naropa uh, could be more effectively engaged in decision making. 
Uh, this idea flowed from the creation of the CREATE 2022, the strategic plan that Janet coordinated. Uh, when I saw how many hundreds of people connected to the Naropa community felt real ownership of the outcome of that plan. Uh, and realized that we needed to continue to take advantage of the wisdom and the energy that those people brought to, to that project. And the result of that conversation was the creation of a university leadership group, which today is about 23 staff and faculty members. It moves a little bit, but I think 23 is the most current number, who are the most responsible for the stewardship of Naropa's resources and who supervise the vast majority of our staff. That group has been meeting weekly for several months. Uh, my goal was to find ways through Janet and Tyler's work to delegate leadership around the crucial issues that we face um, and to delegate it to a greater number of people who have the wisdom and experience to step up. I temporarily suspended the meetings, regular meetings of the cabinet, specifically so that the leadership group would actually have a chance to become established. Uh, that has happened, and the example I gave about the financial aid change happened because a conversation started around that table and then carried on with a smaller group of people that were actually able to get it done. So we have some very specific examples of how it's working. The cabinet is now meeting again, but I think with more clarity around the, its mandate and less motivation to overly manage our senior staff. I'm sure people will let me know if that part of it isn't true, but it's at least the aspiration. I also want to say that the leadership group is not a replacement for the elected staff executive council, and I realize we've got a lot of entities, so people can be confused about it. My view is, is that the SEC now can focus on overall staff health and more effective integration of the staff needs within, uh, with those of the faculty and the students. Um, so there's definitely place for both. The leadership group is, I think, the most significant structural change we've undertaken in a long time to work across divisions and break down the silos that often evolve in any kind of complex organization. Um, so both increased enrollment and improved fundraising success means that Naropa also has to be outward facing and look at fresh and effective ways to share our founding story. He's on listening to Pandora there or something. I don't know what it is. Um, I can't tell the tune. I'll let you know. Um, but we have to find fresh and effective ways to share our founding story, the accomplishments of our faculty and alumni, and to be a visible th thought leader. Also to broaden our offerings to include content and competence not always tied to traditional four-credit degree programs. And it's worth recognizing some examples of that work that's happening now and has happened over the last year. Uh, in October, we produced, and Kelly w was in the middle of this, a series of spark talks at Naropa. Um, Paul Fowler was our MC, and we invited eight alumni to offer TED-like talks on a wide range of topics, the areas that they're actually working on as they've left Naropa. All of them are viewable on YouTube, and they're wonderful ways to show somebody the impact of the Naropa experience. Uh, and also, I think, a chance for us to take great pride in the exceptional people who have graduated from this place, because the talks were incredible. Um, so thank you. I know a couple of people here that provide, gave those talks, and I want to thank you for that. <clears throat> Also, Naropa photographer and videographer David Devine, who apparently is at a music festival in Hawaii, <laughs> who knew, um, is producing a series of podcasts featuring faculty and staff. So these have been launched since sometime in late October, and to date about 7,000 people have downloaded the podcast. Uh, 10 of them are posted, and 16 more are underway. Uh, and I found out that Phil Stanley and Judith Simmer Brown seem to be neck and neck with about a thousand downloads each <laughs> from their podcast. And not that it's at all important, but I'm third. <laughs> and we're going to do something about that. Also, what's really interesting is that David reports that listeners from Thailand and Japan are tied for the most downloads from abroad, but notes to me, and he sent me an email that noted that Trinidad and Tobago was hanging in there. Uh, so that may be an opportunity for us. Uh, I, I note these examples as ways that fresh forms of sharing the Naropa story can indeed have impact. The Authentic Leadership Center, led by Susan Shea and her team, has taken on the overall strategic management of extended studies and professional development offerings. Uh, 
The impactful 15-week certificate program in authentic leadership uh, is happening now. In fact, the on-site is happening this week uh, at Nalanda. This is, I think, Susan, I don't think it's here, but I think it's the 15th year that we've done this program or something like that. It's been quite a while. Uh, and we have just expanded it to include a summer option, which is already, this being the end of January, it's already very well enrolled for June, which is exciting and seems to be meeting a market need. The ALC has also been offering a Mindful at Work program, both in person and online. Some of the clients that we've been uh, selling, to, to be clear, uh, these services too have included Rodale Publishing, Organic India, Naturally Boulder, the University of Colorado Family Medicine uh, Department, and others. We've also just contracted with the government of Jamaica to offer Mindful at Work training to their finance ministry. Cool. A project which was funded by the World Bank uh, requiring us to become a vendor to the World Bank and therefore a project which we think can be replicable to governments across the world. This is true, this, took, this came about really, it's an Europa story. Uh, there's a woman who works for the government in Jamaica who is responsible for professional development training. She has a certificate from the authentic leadership program that she took in Boulder. It was personally and professionally transforming for her. And when they asked her to come up with some mindfulness program, she basically presented our tiny little Colorado-based uh, university as the option. And after many months of bureaucratic uh, negotiation, we signed the contract a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now, before you ask, we have all the staff we need for this coming <laughs> Jamaica program next month. Uh, so you can take that up with Susan, but if it works, we will need more. So I would encourage you to look at the mindful, look at our authentic leadership certificate. Uh, an online version of Mindful at Work is also available to the general public. We're launching, I think, the third uh, in the series of classes, and are working now on a Mindful Leadership at Work online program geared toward uh, leaders and supervisors, and that was really came from the request from a number of the customers that we've been working with. Uh, also, in terms of work that we're doing externally, um, as many people here know, and many have the scars to prove, hosting on-campus conferences is a challenging place to go. So, and if I never had to host another on-campus conference again, I'd be very happy. However, <laughs> uh, there is some value to it as well. And I do need to note the success that we had in December uh, at the Reimagining Death and Dying Conference, which was held at Nalanda, co-sponsored by a number of organizations, including the Boulder Community Health, which is the hospital, uh, the Colorado Hospital Association, the Colorado Chaplains Network, and the Himera Foundation. Uh, particular thanks here to Elaine Ewan and Judy Leaf and the Authentic Leadership Center team for making this uh, event so successful. Now, you know, we should all know that many of the sponsors and many of the participants in the program uh, accept and work with Naropa interns and hire GSCP graduates. So the long-term benefit to Naropa through this collaboration is very important. This coming March, we're actually going to be hosting the American Psychological Association Society for Humanistic Psychology. They have an, uh, a regular national uh, gathering, which this year will be at Naropa. Uh, it's called... It's a long name. It's called Liberation Through Wisdom and Love, colon, Humanistic Psychology, Social Justice, and Contemplative Practice. Kind of hits the sweet spot, right? Um, and so great thanks to people here, particularly Carla Clements uh, and uh, Ian Wickramascara and to Rachel Solom in my office for really working hard to organize this event. They're particular about their events and uh, uh, we are rising to the occasion. Naropa will have a national platform with the uh, American Psychological Association in March, and it's a very good thing for us. Uh, we also just, some of you may have seen some notes from Professor Sue Wallingford. She and several of our art therapy alums just co-produced -pro a very successful conference uh, on art therapy and wellness in Cambodia, kind of flowing from the work that they have done in Cambodia over the years. Uh, that was, program was attended by people from 25 different countries. Uh, all of the Naropa material was gone by the first end of the first day, which, which was great. Uh, and another example of ways that which Naropa is going to the world. So uh, something that was, and really kind of 
funded by incredibly uh, passionate alumni. This was something we provided some marketing support, but the money came from them, and much gratitude to them for that work. Uh, finally, in terms of outreach, let me say that, that uh, both Drs. Judith Simber Brown and Amelia Hall have just launched a free uh, five-week online course, which has been produced in partnership with Shambhala Publications. Uh, it's called The Heart of Mindfulness Meditation, and in it, Judith and Amelia are providing a taste of basically our wisdom tradition curriculum. Uh, again, something that if you know somebody that you'd like to expose to Naropa, this is a pretty low commitment way to experience Naropa, and you can go on to the Shambhala publications or the Canvas websites, Canvas being the platform we're using, and people can just register for this course. So it's something, uh, and it's free. Yes, it's free. Um, CASE, the Center for Advancement of Contemplative Education, directed by Charlotte Rotterdam and advised by Judith Simmer Brown, has had its own impact. Uh, both in Boulder and beyond. CASE is continuing to offer internal resources to the Naropa faculty as the many ways in which contemplative pedagogy continue to evolve. And again this year, CASE will host the Rocky Mountain Dialogue for university faculty representing institutions up and down the front range um, who are engaged in bringing contemplative work into the classroom. This year the uh, dialogue will happen here at Naropa. Um, at the risk of jinxing it, uh, I will say we're also in dialogue with the Colorado Bar Association and the Colorado Supreme Court uh, to offer compassion training to judicial officials. Um, uh, again, something that you know I think we're, we're suited to do and something that's quite replicable um, if we have the opportunity to do it. CASE is also running the second public compassion training course this spring uh, with the help of many faculty. I think this prototype has relevance across many disciplines and sectors and, and really brings to heart what can be, uh, it really brings heart, sorry, to what can otherwise be pretty sterile mindfulness training, which is what a lot of people are exposed to. A little further from home, CASE is going to be offering two events in New York City this spring in partnership with the large retail uh, store ABC Carpet and Home. Um, uh, one of them will feature Professor Janine Canty, who I think is here, um, and, and one uh, led by Ann Waldman. Um, this is not random, but ABC actually reaches into a very wealthy, very curious and progressive uh, customer base. Uh, they get great um, response to the programs that they offer uh, at their facility, and it's an opportunity for Naropa to make connections uh, in New York and the New York City area. So a lot of uh, thanks to Charlotta for putting that together. Uh, and then finally, with respect to CASE, I want to say that I was really honored to experience the extraordinary work of our faculty at a recent national conference that we co-sponsored uh, that was produced by the Contemplative Mind in Higher Education, C-Mind uh, organization. Um, particularly, Regina Smith, Carla Sherrill, and Judith Simmer Brown took the attendees. There were more than 150 faculty and staff who were engaged in higher education, contemplative practice, and social justice through a truly transformative Naropa experience and reinforced the importance of our role in this crucial intersection of contemplative practice and social justice. So gratitude to them. Uh, I was an observer for the conference, and it was amazing to kind of watch people uh, resonate with uh, what was presented to them by people connected to this place. Uh, I also want to make note of the significant impact that the Office for Inclusive Community is having on our university. As many of you know, for the past few years under the leadership of Regina Smith, we moved from a somewhat traditional office of diversity to the not just renamed, but I think really significantly re envisioned Office for Inclusive Community. Diversity and inclusion remain central to the work, but it now covers so much more. In recognition of the university-wide commitment to inclusion and community, uh, Jerry Colonna, who's the chair of our board of trustees, uh, with the help of other trustees has established the first new board committee I think that we've established in years um, to support the office, the OIC, uh, and its work. Um, so that motivation came from the board, 
wasn't something that we asked the board to do, and it was, makes it all the more important, I think, that at the highest level of leadership and really amongst the group of our most generous donors, that the work from the OIC is actually being recognized. Uh, the first meeting of that committee will happen at the upcoming board meeting next week, so we'll see where that goes, but it, I'm excited about it. Um, within OIC and building on the commitment to find alternative ways to address concerns, um, and other interpersonal challenges at Naropa, we've invested uh, in training many staff to restorative justice practices, and people have worked very hard to learn these techniques. Uh, we've also moved uh, our Title IX coordinator, Sarah Silvis Bernstein, into the Office for Inclusive Community, uh, and we did it very deliberately so that the more formal and legal process that's directed by Title IX is also supported by the restorative justice and other less formal processes when that's called for. So I still have a direct relationship as I need to have with Sarah about the legal issues, but Sarah is now within a bigger uh, office that has a more expansive uh, mission. Um, and I have to say that speaking of all things legal, I'm personally incredibly happy that Joy Valenia, um, I don't know if she's here, but happy that Joy returned to Naropa after her endless parental leave. Um, I think her, her daughter is graduating from high school, I think, in March. Uh, and has seamlessly picked up her crucial work. So when you see Joy say, welcome back, it's a good thing. Uh, also talking about Office for Inclusive Community, very excited that, as I noted last year, following the very generous gift by Christopher and Luann Hormel, we conducted a national search for a director of sustainability and successfully completed that search with the great help of the faculty connected to the Joanna Macy Center and, for, and of students. Uh, the success resulted in the hiring of Michael Bauer, who may be here, um, I can't tell who started, uh, started work about four weeks ago um, and also uh, in the Office for Inclusive Community. That was the plan from the beginning um, and we're very happy that we were able to work it out. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't express gratitude on all of our behalf uh, to our Director of Safety and Facilities, Aaron Cook, who held the sustainability um, values and mission for years with limited resources uh, and great passion. So I want to thank Aaron for that. We're also looking to uh, house the Contemplative Practices Office in the uh, OIC. Jovanina Jobson, who has been so diligently directing that work for so long, will continue to offer contemplative practice resources to students, and she is currently sitting within the Student Affairs Office, but is also going to be working with faculty and staff in the broader community, which is something she's also been doing. So it's not new work, but it's maybe a new home. Um, Jovanina will also continue to be a meditation instructor uh, to people who are frequently asking for that support uh, and able to teach uh, in ways that the faculty find helpful as well. So um, really with all of that, I think we can look at the fact that with diversity and inclusion, sustainability and contemplative practice, uh, all within the Office of Inclusive Community, we can aspire to supporting the broadest and most impactful community that Naropa can imagine. And so I think it's a really exciting moment for us. I was pleased last week to be invited to a recent retreat that was organized by Sun, the student government. Uh, we had not so much time together, but had a chance to have some dialogue about how we could work together more closely. Uh, I'm also happy, as I think are many people, that we were able to move the Sun offices to the much more visible location next to the pavilion. Um, I'm hoping that that will have an impact on increasing student engagement with student government, um, which is extremely important. Um, Sun succeeds with increased student engagement, and so uh, anything that we can do to encourage that I think is very important. Um, and the student voice is important. It was the student voice, I would say, that led most immediately to the message that I offered last September uh, in solidarity with the uh, Sanctuary Campus movement. Uh, staff and faculty were working with me on that statement, but when the student voice became um, uh, evident, um, we moved with a special urgency uh, to issue something to uh, the Naropa community and beyond. And I think that's an example of how student engagement can actually have direct impact. Um, 
And as you should know, there is a student trustee who is a fully uh, empowered voting member of the Board of Trustees, nominated by Sun and elected by the board. Uh, and so the student voice is heard uh, at the board table and the more people that show interest in uh, participating uh, in that way, the better uh, from our point of view. A few other things just to note, the Naropa Community Counseling Center, which is serving low-income residents of Boulder County and also offering more internship opportunities for GSCP students, was granted a Medicaid license this past year, which is fantastic. Um, I said last year we were going to apply not knowing what that meant and, and it actually moved at sort of record speed. Um, so assuming there's still a Medicaid, we have a license, uh, <laughs> which is good, whoops. Uh, but the Counseling Center is now able to offer affordable mental health care to a population of people who are frequently going without important uh, mental health services, sometimes seen as lesser of lesser importance to physical health care. Um, and so uh, thanks to the, to the efforts of the staff and the faculty at GSCP for uh, moving us in that direction. Our mental health work is also extending far beyond Boulder. Through the efforts of the Center for Bhutan Partnerships led by Professor Jane Carpenter and faculty at GSCP, we just marked the one year anniversary of two programs at the Royal University of Bhutan. They're a Master of Arts and a postgraduate diploma in contemplative counseling psychology. Amazingly, and I think just remarkably, this is the first professional degree in counseling offered in Bhutan. And 62 Bhutanese students began the program last January. Um, the opportunity and, and the faculty of that program who are Bhutanese faculty are working hand in hand with Naropa faculty. They're working on Skype, they're um, grading papers together, they're getting mentored. Uh, it's a co quite wonderful uh, relationship. And I think to me the opportunity to influence a mental health care system in Bhutan is an honor for Naropa and will have a lasting impact on a country which really up to now has been reliant either on medical doctors who have limited counseling skills, they have prescription writing skills, and, but not much more, uh, or on some occasional foreign volunteers who come from Europe or Australia or New Zealand and provide some very short-term counseling services. Um, I was thinking about this when I wrote it, that nobody exactly understood when Trungpa Rinpoche, a long time ago, almost 50 years ago, said to us that um, students from the West would eventually be taking genuine understanding and effective application of contemplative practice back to Asia. I think we're beginning to understand what he meant. Um, I also need to note that several longtime faculty will be retiring this year, and I'm not going to name names today because more will be done over the course of the semester to celebrate their accomplishments and their heart connection to Naropa. But uh, we can't underestimate the impact that this fa these faculty have had on our university and the impact that their departure will have. As our recent successful searches have shown, we're also attracting skilled and committed younger faculty as well, which is a really good thing. But change inevitably brings a degree of sadness along with celebration. Um, we correctly say that Naropa has a founder, but I think the fact is that it's a place that constantly reinvents itself uh, in both large and small ways. Everyone who engages here is a founder, and so the departure of the founder is something that's worth noted and deeply worth honoring. As is obvious, Naropa is not without its challenges. Practical ones, emotional ones, interpersonal ones, existential ones, the whole <laughs> range. Uh, and while I think that diagnosis is true for any organization it, um, uh, that you can think of, the interesting aspect of working uh, at Naropa is that our family business is actually to study and practice ways to undermine the solidity of the apparently intractable problems and to do so with discipline and humor. So we don't get to bring in consultants, we are the consultants. Um, on the day of the Tibetan New Year, and I think it was about 35 years ago, Trungpa Rinpoche made a statement called, the future is in our hands, which I somehow at six o'clock this morning thought was apt. So we'll see if it still has legs now. Um, what he said was, we hold the threshold of the future of the world in our hands, on our path. When we say this, we're not dreaming, we're not exaggerating. We hold a tremendous hope, maybe the only hope for the future dark age. We have a lot of responsibilities, and those responsibilities are not easy to fulfill. They won't come along easily like an ordinary success story. They have to be stitched, painted, carved, step by step, inch by inch, minute by minute. It will be manual work. 
there will be no automatic big sweep or solution. When something good is done in the world, it's usually difficult. It's manual rather than automatic. When something bad is done, usually that is automatic. Evil things are easy to catch, but good ones are difficult to catch. They go against the grain of ordinary habitual tendencies. There you go. So that's kind of, that's kind of us, at least as my version of us today. Um, I'm going to end by just saying that uh, last summer, um, as my five-year contract was winding down, I actually put a lot of thought into whether or not I would renew it. And that was a surprise to me. I kind of assumed, because I'm not the guy, kind of retired kind of guy, that I would just stay around. But I thought that actually Naropa was owed a more careful and deliberate consideration on my part. And ultimately, in consultation with the board and my colleagues, I did uh, elect to stay on and did so, obviously, happily. Um, because I think I came to the realization, if you have to wake up at all, uh, being awakened by the students, faculty, and staff of this place is a blessing and my good fortune. Um, in the future, I think it's quite safe to say that there will be better presidents, and uh, believe it or not, there might be better students, staff, and faculty as well. Um, but to go back to Bernie Glassman's work in Instructions to the Cook, what we have right here, I think, are all the ingredients that Naropa needs to cook the supreme meal. I look forward to sharing the cooking, the serving, and the cleaning up with all of you. So thanks for what you do to maintain the pilot light that we ignited 44 years ago, and thanks for all of your commitment to Naropa. Thank you.